And we have all the lectures are named after one of the founders of the college and longtime chairman of the board of directors, J.J. Keeson. Walter Clausen comes to us well qualified to lecture on the theme, the emancipated laity of baptism in its time. He received his doctorate of philosophy from Oxford University in Oxford, England, in historical theology, specializing in the field of Reformation and studies. He has held two college professorships, uh, wrote the short one for four years as a professor of Bible and religion at Bethel College, and a long one, 23 years, as professor of history at Conrad College. I'm sure most of us know about Walter and that connection as his professorship at Conrad College. Walter has just now retired from that post, and uh, is busier than ever, like most of the people that are retired from it, and other things in the, in the, on the fire for Walter too. He has held lectureships and <coughs> special papers in Canada, the United States, and Europe. He has written extensively in Anabaptist life and thought, and published numerous articles and authored several books, among them, uh, uh, and a baptism and outline, a book of selected primary sources. Most recently, he has published uh, an article on Anabaptism in the Canadian Encyclopedia, which came out uh, two or so years ago, and also an article on Anabaptist Mennonite Ethics, published in the Westminster Dictionary of Christian Ethics. <coughs> Walter Carson has been editor of the Conrad Grable College Review since 1982, since its inception. And he, he tells us that he had just completed his last editorial job on this review, and the editorship will pass on to somebody else. He is the director of the Institute of Anabaptist and Mennonite Studies at Conrad College, and the Institute of Mennonite Studies at the uh, Associate Mennonite <coughs> Seminaries in Elkhart. One can say much, much more about Walter. He has sent us uh, a 10 page. Uh, Compendium of what he has been doing, what he has been writing. It doesn't take too long to do all that, but um, we're very happy that he can come to us to lecture on us. Not only because Walter is an academician in the field of Baptist studies and Reformation history, but also that he is a, a church member. And uh, he has done his work, his academic work, in the context of, of the church uh, and has devoted a lot of time and energy to the interest of the contemporary church and its developments. Walter is married to uh, Ruth. They have uh, three, three sons, and they have now taken up residence as uh, three, four years ago in the beautiful Okanagan Valley, just uh, south of Vernon, D.C. Walter, we're happy you're here. We look forward to the lecture series. We will continue this evening at 8, tomorrow again at 10 in the morning. There will be coffee at, at uh, 9.30, if you're all invited for that. And uh, then again tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock. The campus bulletin uh, recorded at the say tonight's life was not at 9, but at 8. So if you've got a full of the campus bulletin somewhere, yeah, that is wrong. It is at 8 o'clock. So all we look forward to your presentation. There will be a discussion, uh, questions and discussion after the lecture, so prepare to uh, raise your questions.
Uh, they have always been on that basis. And so that's uh, part of my history that uh, I want you to know. Uh, it is certainly an honor to be included in the lecture series so such, with such an eminent name attached to them. And uh, uh, it's with uh, a good deal of uh, trepidation and I think some anxiety that I entered upon this. But uh, we'll see what happens. The emancipated lady and the baptism at this time, that was the general title I gave. And I hope that that will come through as I go along because I'm uh, working on that subject sort of as we go along from, from lecture to lecture, sometimes by, uh, sometimes implicitly and sometimes directly. When I wrote my doctoral dissertation in Oxford 30 years ago, I already then used the inclusive term Anabaptism to designate the 16th century movement. And I'm doing it again now. In fact, I never quite stopped doing that because it was always my view that there were themes which all of the different groups of Anabaptists had in common. And although I recognize and have accepted most of the conclusions of the social historians who have worked on Anabaptism and who have made numerous differentiations between Anabaptists, and there was a whole lot of different groups with different characters, I have always approached the subject from the vantage point of an adherent of this tradition. And baptism and what emerged from it was in the first place a church holding to a particular interpretation of some, some rather central Christian affirmations. And it is in these convictions that I see the similarities between the different groups. They are theological in nature. I believe that now that the varieties of Anabaptists have been carefully studied, it may be time again to look at the theology, which for them was not peripheral, but central. And so I speak of Anabaptism as a movement that can be distinguished from other religious expressions of the time. And that does not mean, I remind you again, that Anabaptists agreed on all points with each other, because they didn't. There were real differences between the major groups. But nevertheless, I speak of it as a movement, and thereby will certainly incur uh, critiques from some people. An issue that still gets periodic attention in the uh, study of Anabaptism is where to pitch it over. How does it fit into the history of, of Christianity? How does it fit into? The non Mennonite scholars of a, a century ago, and uh, also some Mennonite scholars with them at the time, believed Anabaptism to be the continuation of medieval descent, a medieval descent movement. And that Anabaptists were the 16th century representatives of an unbroken succession. 
reform and reform Christianity as to require a different designation. At that point, I'm sticking to my earlier judgment in that book and hand out the native habit from a Protestant, even though there are some things in there that I would not rather not read. <laughs> the German historian, uh, Monty Gabschesser, described medieval heresy as follows. The common thread running through and linking all heresies from the early part of the Middle Ages through the 15th century was their call for a poor church to supersede the rich, powerful, feudal church. The aim of heresy was not to change the world, much less to bring revolutionary means to bear. At best, it hoped to use its power to chasten the church. Medieval heresies did not, in general, require their adherents to fight. And they sought no violent confrontation with the church. In most cases, their teaching explicitly rejected violence. And even the monstrous power of the Inquisition led only in the rarest cases to active resistance by the heretics. Now this is at the same time as you can see an accurate description of Anabaptism so far as it goes. It was because Anabaptism even <coughs> during the Reformation that it survived, where other earlier movements did not. Even though that same Inquisition attempted to eradicate Anabaptism throughout the 16th and into the 17th century, relative toleration, which came already during the 16th century, in several places enabled Anabaptists to survive. And even the Waldensians who have survived to this day owe their ultimate survival to the changing climate in Europe of the Reformation period. Now, in these lectures, I want to study some aspects of Anabaptist theology in their origins and early affirmation and early formulations. Theological convictions arise out of a complex web of religious, social, political, and economic factors. And so rather than looking at Anabaptist theology systematically, I want to look at it as it developed. Different situations produce different theologies. The most familiar example of this today is liberation theology, which comes out of a very specific set of cultural, religious, and economic conditions, and which gives that theology its special color emphasis. Feminist theology is another example of the same kind of thing. Any new theology emerges out of a dialectic, out of the dialectic between what is understood as divine revelation and the specific historical circumstances in the midst of which that revelation is discovered and comprehended. Hence, as I should try to show, Anabaptist views emerged out of a mix of convictions arising out of Bible study, and experiences of conflict and This way of approaching theology in no way devalues the integrity of the theology that emerges. 
tradition to hell that the two distinct sources were each authority by, it, by itself as sources of divine truth. The church was, of course, always the interpreter of scripture. There was no thought here of private interpretation. Now, the degradation of papal authority in the 14th century produced an unprecedented crisis of authority in the church. Especially when, following the year 1378, there were two, and later on, even three claims to the throne of Eden. A Catholic historian graphically describes the throne of Christendom. He writes, It is hard for us to imagine the confusion wrought in souls by such anarchy. Schism had been brought about this time not by the ambitions of a German emperor, but by the very men who were the repository of the Holy Spirit, and it caused a havoc in the conscience of man. Its repercussions were felt throughout Christendom, in diocese upon diocese, parish upon parish, monastery upon monastery, bishop rose against bishop, priest against priest, abbot against abbot. No one could be certain of his faith or of the validity of his obedience. In the words of the chronicler of Frost Arm, folk marveled that the church could have fallen into such dire troubles and remained in them so long. The spiritual anguish thus generated increased from day to day. Desolation overwhelmed the souls of men, and it was widely believed that no one had been <coughs> to paradise since the beginning of the city. Christendom, so sorely rent, was slowly found into chaos. Where was the authority in such a situation? There were those who, like John Wycliffe and John Bush and Bessel Monsfort, who were proponents of tradition one, according to which every element of tradition, that is, anything that could not be found directly in Scripture, had to pass the test of conformity to Scripture. That way the church was not deprived of its authority when it found itself in a crisis of leadership as of that time. But there were also those who supported tradition too. And these were chiefly the scholars, Jean Gerson and Pierre Dailly at the University of Paris, and also William of Ockham, an Englishman, and Gabriel Wien, a German. These scholars argued that tradition was an authority in its own right alongside of Scripture, and that its integrity would be assured by replacing the single papacy, now in such disarray, with a council of Christians, which would more adequately represent the tradition, which would care for it better. And thus the Church, through its bishops and doctors, would interpret both Scripture and tradition. These two approaches to the question of the relationship of scripture and tradition, both orthodox Catholic views, were offered as a way of interpreting awful trial. When Martin Luther protested against the wild claims of the indulgence preachers in 1517, quite unaware that he had started what we today call the Protestant Reformation, Christendom began to separate along the lines of Oberman's two traditions. The Protestant Reformation followed Tradition I, and the Council of Trent, the chief event of the Catholic Reformation, followed Tradition II. The Anabaptists took up the call of Tradition I, following the Reformers, and using it not only against Rome, but also against Holbert Zwingli and Martin Luther. The main elements of the Anabaptist articulation of Tradition One were already present earlier, for example, in the work of Wessel Gansford, the Dutch theologian who died in 1479. His position can be summarized as follows. The Spirit speaks continually to the Church through internal testimony, through Scripture, and through the Magisterium, through the teaching office of the church, wherever, whenever, and insofar as this magisterium does not set aside the commands of God and enjoin their own man-made commands, nor 
misers of God, men who think piety is gain. The unity of the church is the special task of the Holy Spirit, which does not lead it to a Roman final. God's word asserted that a Christian is not bound to anything that falls outside the canon of Scripture. Tradition, therefore, did not have equal value to the Scripture. This debate about the relative authority of Scripture and tradition, then, was part of the intellectual landscape when the Reformation began. The recovery of the papacy following the Council of Constance in 1450 which incidentally also condemned Arthur's, tended to strengthen and can replace the tradition. It was Martin Luther's protest against the irresponsible claims of the indulgence of salesmen in 1517 and the resulting controversy that eventually pushed him to become a defender of the sole authority of Scripture by which all claims to authority of non scriptural tradition were to be judged. So Scriptura became one of the chief rallying cries of the Reformation, and Anabaptists also accepted it and used it. Traditions of the Church, such as indulgences, were called mention saxona, human traditions by Luther, meaning not that they had no legitimacy, but that, they, but that they had no inherent authority. They could be permissible, but they could never be natural. An example of this was Luther's attitude toward images in the churches. Since they were not forbidden in the New Testament, he said they could stay. In Zurich, they also talked about the doctrine of men and the superiority of the scriptures, but were much more restrictive about how much of what had come from the past was permissible in the new evangelical faith. Whereas Luther's rule of thumb was that whatever 
Others constructed a kind of succession of dissidents, a successio dissidentum, according to which the truth, the truth of the gospel had been preserved by a succession of faithful witnesses, which constitute a kind of suffering church. A view that was first put forward tentatively in the great chronicle of the Hutterites and made into the view of history in the martyr's mirror. Hence, Anabaptists tended to talk more about restitution than about reform. The logical consequence of which was the formation of a separate church in continuity with the apostolic church of the New Testament, but discontinuous with the church of Rome and the Protestant churches. Now, the Anabaptists stood as firmly on sola scriptura as anyone else in the 16th century. But it was a sola scriptura with a difference. The problem emerged first in Zurich in the debate on baptism in 1524. As the debate on the question of baptism accelerated between Zwingli and some of his followers, Zwingli began to defend the baptism of infants theologically with a doctrine of divine covenant rooted in primarily in the Old Testament, and with the claim that Christian baptism was the New Testament parallel to Old Testament circumcision. At first, surprised by Swinley's resort to the Old Testament, uh, on an issue that seemed to be unique to the New, these followers of his soon rejected his use of the Old Testament as a legitimate authority for the affairs of the Church. Beyond that, however, there was another issue that made up the sola scriptura and double-edged sword. And that was the rejection by the reformers of the medieval method of biblical interpretation. It was a method that looked for the spiritual meaning of the text beyond the obvious literal message. And while it was not an arbitrary method of interpretation, there was a danger of regarding the literal meaning as the least important. And so, for example, the parable of the Good Samaritan indeed carried a clear mandate for Christian ethical behavior. But then one proceeded to the spiritual meaning, by which one could see in the Samaritan a type of the church which mediates salvation to the victims of sin of the wine of the Eucharist and the anointing oil of supreme unction. The reformers rejected this method because they said it was used to legitimate church doctrine, which they regarded as erroneous. They insisted that the plain political meaning was what God had intended with the words. Swindon had been influenced very strongly by the humanist scholar Erasmus to take the literal text seriously. He acquired a copy of the newly published Greek New Testament of Erasmus, and he committed large sections of it to memory. And when he began preaching in Zurich in 1519, he literally did a Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew, using as texts the words of that Gospel, section by section. He wanted his people to know the teachings of Jesus, and he wanted them to follow those teachings. For he said, Christian faith was not just a theology, but it was also a way of living. In theory, sola scriptura meant that the scriptures were an authority for both theology and ethics in a very direct way. But Satan had inherited the view that citizenship in the city of God and citizenship in the earthly city were co terminus that belonging to the church and to the civic community were inseparable. The city of Zurich represented a special version of this accepted Christian view, in that over the preceding centuries it had become normative for the city government 
also to take responsibility for the affairs of the church and of public morality. By the time of the Reformation, the city council was in effective control of church affairs. The council issued mandates against gambling and against dancing. They determined which holy days were to be observed. They took action against the delinquent clergy. They oversaw the monasteries. When Swinley came to Zurich, a working relationship developed between him and his fellow clergy and the city council. All together were responsible for the church and the civic life of the city. Now, as the argument over baptism illustrates, Swinley was developing a covenantal theology which combined the Old and New Testaments theologically. And it was as part of this theology, as I already said, that he developed his defense of infant baptism. But the vision of a Christian commonwealth in which clergy and magistrate worked together as joint servants of God also required the support of the Old Testament because the New Testament could not first model this. And when this became clear to the to Swingley's probing followers, they proceeded to develop the most restrictive version of Sola Scriptura in Reformation times. Instead of taking a theological view of the relationship between the Old and the New Testaments as the Reformers did, they took what we would today, today best call a historical view. They identified the Old Testament with law and the New with gospel. These two, these were two separate covenants, and the new covenant had now succeeded and replaced the old. And thus the New Testament superseded the Old Testament. The Old Testament was fulfilled in the new, and one did not go back to the promise of the Redeemer now that the Redeemer had already come. And so for anything related to the life under the new covenant, for both the individual Christian as well as for the church, it was the New Testament that was authoritative, and the old only insofar as it was in harmony with the new. The New Testament was regarded literally as literally binding on the believer. It literally became a law of the Lord. Although much of this was Erasmian and Swinglian, they differ with the Zurich Reformation specifically on the question of the scriptural legitimation of Christian political institutions and their claims to exercise authority in religious matters. That is the subject for the last chapter of the series. The question of baptism came to be connected with this view of government. The more this view became operated for the dissidents and later in ambassador, the more surely it became the occasion for collision with Christian governments. Although I described the early situation in the Zurich here, and the Baptists everywhere eventually adopted virtually identical views on the nature of Sola Scriptura, their view of the lesser authority of the Old Testament was not Marcionite, as has occasionally been argued, but rather viewing the Old Covenant with its scriptures as the forerunner and promise of the New with its scriptures. In this sense, Anabaptists attempted to undercut the legitimation for any church traditions not specifically rooted in the New Testament. A word should be said here about interpreting the Bible, since that affects how the principle of Sola Scriptura works in practice. In the papal church, it was understood by all that the scriptures were interpreted by the church through those appointed to do so. At the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, there was a good deal of confidence in lay people interpreting the Bible, along with the scholars. But that soon came to be modified when lay people began to interpret the Bible by the ways that challenged existing power arrangements. The Twelve Articles of the Peasants being a perfect illustration of the point. The rise of Anabaptism in Zurich was another example. Reformers soon learned that Sola Scriptura did not guarantee uniformity of interpretation. Hence the old rule that the church interprets, or at least that there was official interpretation that was binding on all, 
also became the norm in Protestants. The clergy scholars became the interpreters, and the interpretations were enforced. And the Baptists were from the beginning examples of lay interpreters liberated from clerical control. They developed a deep-seated distrust of scholars, blaming them for the error and corruption of the church. Even though there were scholarly interpreters in Anabaptism at the beginning, and their interpretations had considerable subsequent influence, and even though among Anabaptists two strong leaders sometimes dominated, there was more room for lay interpretation because such activity was rewarded in those churches rather than punished. It appears also that the congregation played a considerable role in guiding lay interpretation so that it did not degenerate into individualistic subjectivism. It was simply that as mature, responsible believers, they were expected to participate in Bible interpretation. Now all of the foregoing might suggest that the might suggest the conclusion that Anabaptists retain nothing at all of past traditions of the church except the scriptures. That they jettisoned more of the past than the reformers is indeed true, but that they retain nothing at all is to make an ideological rather than a factual case. In fact, they retain surprisingly many remnants of past tradition which were often hard to merge into a cohesive whole. Uh, when you break away from an older tradition, you only bring along all kinds of fragments, and then it's a kind of broken up tradition that you're working with. <laughs> Certainly, most Anabaptists would have rejected any suggestion that they retain church traditions not found in Scripture. But it is equally certain that they maintain some of those extra scriptural traditions knowingly. But of course, they couldn't talk about them in those days. In the midst of controversy and martyrdom, such acknowledgement could never be. Looking back now, we can make see uh, that for all of the Anabaptist rejection of mentioned Satsuma, the traditions of men, they nevertheless bore many marks of the earlier tradition. They accepted the scriptures which the church had transmitted. It is surprising, in fact, that Anabaptists never made the argument that the scriptures represented a continuing succession from the earliest days of Christianity to their own. Maybe it was implicit. It's never discussed. And that in turn might have suggested also faithful transmitters and custodians of this authority, which became so exclusively important to them. And Anabaptists also retained as scripture the apocryphal books which were rejected as authority in scripture by the way Marcus, but were accepted by the older church. And this happened because the Apocrypha, with their concern for moral behavior, supported the Anabaptist emphasis on deeds rather than creeds as the identifier of who was a Christian. There was no scriptural injunction on the basis of which these books were retained. Anabaptists also accepted and viewed without criticism the translations of scripture done by Lutheran Sphinx. This involved the confidence that these translations, done by people to whom they often referred to as scribes and Pharisees, did not obscure the true word of God. Some Anabaptists were indeed able to check the translations against the Hebrew and the Greek text, but most could not. And I know of no single instance where there's an argument about this. There was no biblical command to use translations or one translation rather than another. And this might seem to be a trivial argument, but it is so only so long as we think that we retain and use only what is biblical. And Baptists, especially in Germany and the Netherlands, often use the creeds, in particular the Apostles' Creed, as adequate statements of belief. So when they were asked, what do you believe? They would simply recite the Apostles' Creed. Now these are a clear and unambiguous part of the church's tradition, which are not part of the Bible. Some Anabaptists use the Apostles' Creed along with the Lord's Prayer quite traditionally as means of instruction of new converts. 
in setting forth his views. He clearly regarded it as authoritative, although many of its terms are not biblical terms. The doctrine of the Trinity was regarded in the, in the church as the center and heart of the Christian tradition. Yet nowhere is it enunciated in Scripture as it was enunciated by the Great Council. And Baptists accepted it along with most other Christians. And I make this point here because there were some others in the 16th century who spotted that problem. When writing about Jesus, Anabaptists resort therefore to terms which are not found in the Bible, but which were used in the creeds as part of the church's tradition. Even at the heart of Anabaptists, the baptism of believers, there were traditional elements not found in Scripture. There is no explicit scriptural, scriptural warrant for extensive instruction prior to baptism. The church in the early centuries developed the practice, it was continued, and Anabaptists of their turn continued it. There are certainly no instructions in Scripture as to how the rituals of baptism and the Lord's Supper were to be structured. But we have a number of such orders developed and used by early Anabaptists. There were rich, they, they produced a ritual for the ordination of pastors. And there is no scriptural warrant that I know of for the shepherd or pastor to preside at the Lord's Supper. And where is the biblical warrant for the practice of dedicating infants as a way of meeting the arguments of the child baptizers about the necessity of the Christian nurture of children? And yet one notable Anabaptist proposed such a ceremony. And it didn't even have the sanction of earlier church tradition, but was developed de novo. No doubt one could find other instances of extra biblical usages in Anabaptism. The reason for this reversal is not to show that Anabaptists were not as biblical as they thought they were, but to illustrate that scripture and tradition often flow together, because the Bible does not give detailed guidance on every question. It is at that point that the extra biblical traditions develop. This is perhaps also the point at which I should remind you again that Anabaptists were the main carriers in the Reformation period of medieval anti clericalism and other traditions. A highly critical attitude toward the official clergy. And with the flip side of that, a conviction about the superior ability of lay people to understand the gospel. And that view. But the view that God had revealed his mysteries to the simple people found in the portion of the Gospels. And so does the hostility toward religious leaders who don't do what they confess. But Anabaptists were here also the carriers of an old tradition that took on institutional forms. And the links between them and the older representatives of the same ideas are not hard to find. They stood in continuity with this particular aspect of the Christian tradition. And of that stretched long before, even though it was officially identified as heresy. There were also some notable omissions of specific New Testament practice.
struggling with today because we are convinced that there is high value in traditional formulations and practices that go beyond our own tradition. For others, tradition is a bad word or conjures up antique practices which do not mesh with modernity. We still nourish the delusion that we base ourselves on scripture only. Even as Anabaptists read the scriptures through the tradition of anti-clericalism, so we read the Bible through our various modern traditions. There is, of course, our own Anabaptist tradition which becomes a pillar for us. To pick up only one example, of non-existence. We tend simply to follow our own tradition with this view that the Bible teaches non-resistance. And this has closed our eyes to the fact that Jesus' scriptures of the Old Testament do not teach us. We've only recently begun to look at what other Christians have always known. And we are now considering what we're dealing with today. Another tradition is Protestant liberalism, which saw the kingdom of God come on earth in this century, and which tended to make out of the gospel a set of ethical principles that some were off the Anglo-Saxon. And some of us were, and some remain, convinced that this ethical approach meshes very well with what we know about Anabaptism. And we still frantically hope and work for a kingdom of God that will be brought about by social and political improvements. Yet another tradition is Protestant fundamentalism, which has made of God's salvation of the world a religion of feeling and private morality with very little understanding for the common faith of Christians, and even less for the Christian solidarity with all the people on this earth. And there, too, we feel a kinship with Anabaptism because of its often feverish separatism and moralistic judgments on others. We also read the Bible through the tradition of North American affluence, with its consumer mentality, and I've come to assume that if people are poor or on welfare, they must be unfaithful Christians because the Bible promises that if we are faithful, we will be materially blessed without faith. And so we can go on identifying tradition upon tradition, which determine the way we read the Bible, and which are authorities for us alongside the Bible that we read. But we remain very reluctant to listen to the tradition of the churches from which we separated in the 16th century. This is not an admonition for all of us to become Roman Catholics or Lutherans, not. But it is to say that we should look carefully and with expectation to the older Christian tradition, especially at points where we part in company with it. We could learn that infant baptism did not develop in the church because someone was determined to lead the church astray. The church did not abandon its early non-resistance because it did not care about the gospel. The church did not develop a doctrine of transubstantiation simply to mystify people and to keep them in ignorance. It did not encourage prayers for the intercession of the saints to corrupt the church through superstition. Martin Luther did not develop his doctrine of justification by faith alone in order to escape the imperative of Christian living. 